everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Littman. I'm a computer scientist, and I'm really glad you're here today because, well, we need to have a little talk about our relationship with computers. Things haven't been going so well between us and computers lately. People are very worried that computers are going to steal our jobs. They're going to steal our games. They're going to steal our privacy. Some people are afraid they're going to steal our lives. So what's going on here? It wasn't always like this. Back in the old days, computers were just a tool that we could use to, um, to amplify <laughs> our thoughts and, uh, and to do really important things for us, like, for example, helping with our algebra homework. So what changed? What's different now from then? I think what's happened is, in the early days, computers weren't so easy to use. They were, they were pretty in intimidating, pretty foreign to everyone. And I think that made them inaccessible, difficult to use. And so in 1980, Steve Jobs and his team at Apple created a new kind of computer, the Macintosh, that was intended to be friendly, easier for us to, to, to relate to. It welcomed us into its world. And I think that was a really good thing. And so in the years that followed, companies like Apple, they, they, they became a kind of a bridge for us between us and our machines. They kind of filled that gap, connecting us to the machine. But unfortunately, over time, that gap became kind of a power vacuum. And it was irresistible for companies that had a lot of computer science expertise to move into that gap and take control over the connection between us and our machines. They, they, they impacted the way we used them and sometimes even impacted our ability to access them at all. We goofed. And I think that, uh, that we need to find a way to fix this, to get this relationship back. So here's what I propose. There's good news and bad news. The bad news is we all need to become programmers. The good news is that doesn't sound as bad as it actually is. And that's because two major things have changed since the 1980s. One is the community knows much better now how to build software that actually is accessible to a wide variety of people. So that's great. And the other one, the more recent development, is that we now have tools from artificial intelligence and machine learning that can help, just help us, can help us bridge the gap between us and the machines. So I want to tell you a little bit about how that might, what that might look like. So the major way that we have up till now for, for telling machines what it is that we want them to do for us is something we would call coding. Now the idea of coding is that you give instructions to the computer. You spell out step by step what it is that you want the computer to do for you. And it's great because it's very direct, it's very formal, but it's also, it also puts a lot of burden on the, the programmer, him or herself. And I think that's made it intimidating for a lot of people to, to, uh, to engage with. But lately, we have a whole new set of tools that are being created by researchers in the machine learning and artificial intelligence community. And they have kind of jargony, maybe intimidating names. But I really do want to tell you about them. And I, and I found something really useful that I can use as a, as, a, as a bit of a roadmap. And it's this quote from the, the 1960s. The quote says, it's, it's about, well, it wasn't about computers at the time, it was about people teaching people. And it says that the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, the great teacher inspires. And I have some issues with this quote. <laughs> One of them, it seems kind of judgy to me. Uh, in particular, as somebody who spends a lot of energy and time teaching, I wouldn't say that the, the main thing that you want to do is inspire. I mean, I was inspired to read when I was a kid, but if nobody told me how to read, I wouldn't have learned to read. So we really need all these different components working together to effectively communicate information. And that's true in teaching, but it's also true in how we can tell machines what to do. So let's go through these kind of one at a time. The idea of coding is we tell the machine what to do. We spell out all the different steps. And so as a concrete example, imagine that we want to create a program that will play chess with us. Right? It can be a partner for us as we're, as we're practicing our chess game. So the, the coding way of thinking about 
this, says you have to sit down and write a set of rules that says if the board, the chess board looks this way and the pieces are in this arrangement, then the computer should make this move in response. And you can do that, but often the rules end up becoming very complicated and difficult to keep uh, into your head. But there's an alternative. There's a number of alternatives. One of them is, is the idea of reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you don't give detailed instructions to the machine about what move to take. You kind of back off from that a little bit and say, here are the rules of chess, and here's the objective. Here's your incentive. You should be trying to move to win the game. And then you leave it up to the computer to figure out how to do that. Now that's a really kind of interesting and exciting thing because it means you don't have to actually come up with the solution, you just have to kind of sketch it out and the computer can fill in the details. And that's incredibly powerful. So instead of just telling the machine what to do, you're explaining how it could work and you're letting it fill in the details. In supervised machine learning, you don't tell the computer anything. You just give it examples. You show it, here's a pattern of input-output connections that you should try to copy. And this has turned out to be incredibly powerful. In the past five years, 10 years, uh, it's very much changed the way that we can talk to computers because of speech recognition. Computers are better at being able to recognize images. Weather prediction has gotten a lot better. Helping you uh, with writing. Is, is all, the, all these things are being enabled by supervised machine learning. In the chess setting, that would mean, for example, telling the machine or t conveying to the machine how to play chess by giving it lots of examples of expert chess players, maybe millions of games of expert chess players. And it would then figure out a pattern of how to map chess boards to chess moves. So in supervised learning, what we're doing is demonstrating what we want, and the computer is then filling in the details. Now, in the idea of inverse learning says, it's like supervised learning. We're going to give lots of examples to the machine, but what the machine is going to try to pull out of those examples is what it is you're actually trying to do, so that it can take on those, those goals for itself and then apply them in new situations. So this technology is actually being used, for example, to create systems that can draw photorealistic images of faces, for example, or, or figure out how to drive in a style that, that matches your personal comfort by watching you drive. In the chess setting, that would be something like watching you play a whole bunch of games of chess and learning if you kind of prefer to be more aggressive with your play or more conservative with your play, and then the machine can actually adopt that same style. So what you're really doing is you're inspiring the, the, the computer to kind of pick up your values and to, and to adopt them as its own. So we have this wonderful palette of, of possibilities for how we can tell machines what to do. And what we need now is people to pull these ideas together, make them accessible, and make them broadly available. And it turns out that's actually kind of a big ask because the people who are in the best situation to do this to, to create the technology, to make it accessible, and to, to offer it very broadly are exactly the same tech companies that at the moment are taking away a lot of our power. So that seems kind of daunting and kind of uh, pessimistic. But I remain optimistic. And one of the things that actually makes me feel optimistic is the story of Hangul. Hangul is the writing system that's used in, uh, for, for the Korean language. And it was actually created in the 1400s. Up until that time, the Korean language was written in a version of a, of a Chinese script. And it wasn't really that well adapted to Korean, and it was really hard to learn to use. So the only people who spent time learning how to use it were people who needed it for their jobs, scholars and government officials. And everybody else was basically left illiterate because it was just too difficult to pick up. And the king at the time, Sejong, said, I don't like this. I think everyone should be able to read and write. It seems like such a great thing. So he created himself a new writing system called Hangul. And what was great about Hangul, which should be familiar to all of us who, who can read and write in English, is that the letters, the symbols, actually corresponded to sounds. And it was much easier for people to pick up. It's actually simpler than English orthography in many, many ways. It was such a great idea. And so he proposed this idea to his advisors in the court. He said, I think we should like, make this into a thing. And the advisors said, mm, I don't know. We spent a lot of time learning it the way that we learn it. It kind of works for us. 
Besides, why would normal people really need to read and write anyway? And so we hear these same kind of counter arguments against broad programming literacy as well. In Korean, they, they, they got over it, and, and now this is, this is the writing system that's actually in, in general use. I would very much like to see us get that, that, to that place in, in the context of programming, and we need two things to make that happen. One is, we need somebody like Sejong and his supporters to create this technology and make it available. But it's also up to all of us to then learn how to use this and apply it in our daily lives, actually make it count for us. And I think it's really important that we do that now for a bunch of reasons. First of all, because I think it's super fun. I think people would really enjoy this if they spent, spent the time to, to do it. But also because, well, some things have changed recently. And I think the main thing that's changed is that there's, there's kind of just too much information out there for us to, to absorb it all. And I would say that more information is generally a better thing. I think when, when the, the founders of the, of the country were thinking about what was going to be important for a democracy to be functioning, they said that it was absolutely essential that people get, have, have an education and that they actually have information about what's really going on so that they can play an active role in governing society and not just leave it to you know, the experts. And so, in the Constitution is ensconced the idea of freedom of the press. And so you'd think, given that there's so much information available to us now, and information is so important to be able to, to run a democracy, that democracy would never be stronger than it is right today. And that's just not the case. Right? Democracy is actually struggling in our country and worldwide. So why is that? And I think, I think one of the major reasons is exactly because there's so much information, so much information that we actually need computers to help filter some of it out and, 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 and present to us the information that, um, that we're going to actually get to see. And there's programs called recommendation systems that are actually doing this for us all the time. And these programs are created using the same four tools that we were talking about. Telling and explaining and demonstrating and, and inspiring, not expiring. Uh, and the problem is that those programs are actually being controlled by corporations. And the corporations don't necessarily have our best interests at heart. And so, for example, these recommendation systems are sometimes programmed to just increase the number of clicks that you'll, that you'll make when you're, when you're seeing information, the number of things that you'll click on, which maybe is not a terrible idea, but it actually turns out to be problematic because it tends to encourage people to get riled up, to seek out information that's actually going to make them stressed. And we can't really change it because we don't have, we, all of us, don't have access to the recommendation systems to change their behavior to be more appropriate to what we actually want. And that's a problem. That's, that's really getting in the way. It's taking away our freedom, in a sense. And so to try to understand this better, I actually went back and read pieces of uh, On Liberty by John Stuart Mills, which you know your typical computer science professor is not spending a lot of time doing. But I actually thought it was really interesting, the echoes of, of some of his ideas and, and their applicability to today. And in particular, John Stuart Mills, his claim is that the main purpose of government is to provide us freedom and, and to let us do whatever it is that we want, except the things that are actually going to hurt other people. That was where he drew the line. So that seems good. But he did carve out an exception. He said, when a society is not ready to self-govern, then it's OK to have a benevolent dictator, somebody who's going to watch out for you and help you develop and help society get to the point where it can actually take responsibility for its own decisions. And I want to say that back in 1984, that was, that was Steve Jobs. He was our benevolent dictator. And he did a pretty good job. But it's not the 1980s anymore. And we, as a society, we know more about computing than we did then. We're more sophisticated. We're more literate. We're ready, I think, to try to take on some of the responsibilities of being active participants in our digital democracy, as it were. And I think that's actually going to be really important for our relationship with computers. It's going to make it more productive. It's going to make it more healthy. It's going to make it more empowering. And I'm concerned that it may be the only thing that we've got for actually protecting real-world democracy as well. Thanks very much.